there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year. And it's called daylight savings time. Now in the spring, when we lose just one hour of sleep, what we found is that the next day, there is actually a 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. Wow. Isn't, isn't that remarkable? Today on Not Alive, we are speaking with Matt Walker, professor of neuroscience at UC Berkeley, and arguably the world's most foremost expert on sleep. If you think you're fine after six hours, or even you are getting eight hours of sleep at night, you still want to hear this. His 2017 bestseller, Why We Sleep, summarizes years of research, all pointing to the fact that we absolutely must sleep enough and sleep well to have a healthy, productive life. Now he'll tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes. Yeah. So sleep is one of those really interesting things, is it not? I mean, you think about the fact that we spend uh, one third of our lives lying down and doing nothing. <laughs> and yet we all need it. So tell us about why. Yeah, it is that sort of common idea that, you know, when we sleep, our brain is largely dormant and our body just lies at rest. Nothing further could be sort of away from the truth. The body undergoes a remarkable overhaul in terms of all of its physiological systems, your cardiovascular system, your immune system, your metabolic system, all of your hormones. And then upstairs in the brain, in fact, during certain stages of sleep, some parts of your brain are up to 30% more active than when you're awake. And during deep sleep, for example, the brain is transferring memories from short term to long term, so you don't forget. It's recalibrating your emotional networks so that you wake up with a stable mood and a positive mood. And it also refines your decision-making capacities as well. But what I love about your question, Nelda, is sort of, just the idiocy of sleep, when you think about it, from an evolutionary perspective, because firstly, when we're asleep, we're not finding a mate, we're not reproducing, we're not caring for our young, um, we're you know, not finding food, and we're still, we're vulnerable to predation. So on any one of those grounds, but especially as a collective, sleep should have been strongly selected against in the course of evolution. And in fact, it's been said that if sleep does not serve an absolutely vital function, then it is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process has ever made. And what we've learned over the past 20 or 30 years now is that mother nature did not make a spectacular blunder creating this thing called sleep. In fact, sleep is probably mother nature's best effort yet at immortality. It's remarkable. Mm. The brain is an interesting, interesting organ, and I and and we'll go further into what the body is doing if we can while we are sleeping. Do you have some specifics on that? Yeah. So let me come on to the immune system because I think it's so relevant right now. Um, there is a very intimate relationship between your sleep health and your immune health, and it's during sleep that, firstly, we actually restock the weaponry in our immune arsenal. And so sleep will actually stimulate the creation of lots of wonderful immune factors that will help you fight off and make you more resilient as an organism. But what we've also discovered is that it's not only during sleep that you produce these critical immune um, factors, but your body is sensitized to those immune factors. So when you wake up the next morning, you've got more of them and your body is better able to receive them. And that's why we find when you start sleeping less, you become immune compromised. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Firstly, what we know is that individuals who are sleeping less than seven hours a night are almost three times more likely to become infected by the rhinovirus, which is uh, the common cold. We also know that women who are sleeping um, five hours or less a night 
are more than 70% more likely to go on to develop pneumonia, which is a critical respiratory infection, which we know is part of the COVID equation. And finally, what we've learned is that if you are getting just, let's say, four to five hours of sleep in the week before you get your flu shot, you only produce 50% of the normal antibody response. You produce, in fact, less than half of the normal antibody response, rendering that immune uh, vaccination largely useless. So these, this is just one example in the immune system. I could go into, as I said, the cardiovascular system, your reproductive system, um, the regulation of your appetite uh, and how uh, that works with sleep or um, any manner of these things. But that was just one example that I think is perhaps relevant during this moment in time. So does your research explain, Matt, why we dream and maybe sometimes why our dreams are so weird? <laughs> it actually does. Um, so let me start with why we dream. Um, we've discovered at least two different benefits to the dreaming process. And actually taking a quick step back, we have two principal types of sleep, what we call non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. And it's during REM sleep when your brain principally dreams. That's what we think of as dream sleep. What are its functions? The first one that we've discovered is that dream sleep provides an enhancement of creativity. It's during dream sleep that the brain um, gathers all of the information that you've learned, and it's almost like informational alchemy. Uh, it's almost like group therapy for memories, where REM sleep, dream sleep, starts to fuse all of the information that you learned today with all of your back catalog of information so that when you wake up the next day, you have a revised mind-wide web mm -hmm. of associations. Wow. And it's that ability that results in you being able to create or come up with um, solutions to previously impenetrable problems. And it's the reason sort of, you know, I, I doubt Nelder, although correct me, no one has ever told you to stay awake on a problem. In fact, you're told to sleep on a problem. And that's exactly what we've been uh, discovering so far uh, to date. So that's the first benefit of, um, of dream sleep, of dreaming. The second is that dreaming provides a form of overnight therapy. Dreaming is actually emotional first aid. And it's during dream sleep at night when we take these difficult, sometimes even traumatic experiences, and the dreaming brain almost acts like a nocturnal soothing balm. And it takes the sharp edges off those difficult experiences so that you come back the next day and you feel better about them. And so in that sense, it's not time that heals all wounds, but it's time during dream sleep that provides that sort of emotional convalescence, as it were. So those are two functions of dreams. I can tell you more a little bit about um, why dreams are so bizarre, but let me just stop there because I hate sort of doing uh, just constant monologuing. Oh, no, that's fine. You know, it's interesting because the brain is such a fascinating organ. It, it, it uh, uh, fascinating. So let's just talk about then how much sleep are people actually getting and how much should we really be getting? So right now, the recommendation is somewhere between seven to nine hours of sleep. And there certainly is a range. Um, some people can uh, sort of uh, function perfectly well on seven hours. Others, as I said, will need more than that. What we also know, however, is that the number of people who can survive on, let's say, less than six hours a night without showing any impairment rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percent of the population is zero. Wow. So, okay. and, and one of the problems I think with, with sleep, and it's so understandable, I'm not trying to sort of be finger wagging or, or, or point at anyone, but our subjective perception of how well we're doing when we're not getting sufficient sleep is actually a miserable predictor of objectively how well you're doing when you're not getting enough sleep. In other words, it's a little bit like a drunk driver at a bar. You know, they've had six or seven shots, a couple of beers, and they pick up their car keys and they say to you, look, I'm fine to drive home. And your response is, no, I know that you think you're fine to drive home subjectively, but objectively, trust me, you're not. 
It's the same problem with a lack of sleep. We don't know we're sleep deprived when we are sleep deprived. And I think that leads people into sort of thinking that they are one of those, you know, remarkable people sort of, you know, this almost um, certainly in the business world, the sleep machismo attitude that I can get by on five hours of sleep and, and I am just fine. I, I can I can learn to cope or I can learn to develop resilience against sleep deprivation. And that's probably foolhardy. You know, it took Mother Nature 3.6 million years to evolve this thing called the necessity of a seven to nine hour night of sleep. And then we think within, you know, a, a year or two, we could, you know, find some magical way that, you know, she hasn't to survive on less than that. And that's probably a mistake. Aren't there some people, though, who can function on four or five hours sleep? There are. There is a very rare set of genetic mutations. Uh, we're identifying at least uh, two to three different genes right now that seem to allow people to survive uh, or survive, I, let, let me take that back, who can function from a brain perspective on as little as six hours and 15 minutes. Hmm. Now, so again, when we say that, you know, these genetic mutants, even those people are at six hours and 15 minutes. And what we also know from survey data is that the average American adult is trying to survive on about six hours and 32 minutes uh, during the week. And that's just not going to cut it, which means that there's a large distribution, by the way, who are even lower than that in terms of their sleep amount. So you're absolutely right. There are these sort of genetic mutants who, if you sort of bring them into um, a sleep center like my own, you take away their phone and uh, you say goodbye to your friends and family, we've got you for two weeks, and no windows, no nothing, and you just let them sleep as much as they want they sort of wash out at around six hours and 15 minutes. Whereas people who say, oh, I'm fine with six hours, that's, that's my natural need. You do that experiment and you end up finding that they actually sleep about um, seven hours and 50 minutes or something along those lines. Um, to put the context there regarding the likelihood, because a lot of people listening right now will say, I think I'm one of those genetic mutants. Um, the likelihood that you are is probably low. In fact, you're far more likely to be struck by lightning in your lifetime than you are to actually be one of these genetic mutants. Okay, Matt. So let's talk about health. Your book discusses a lot of health consequences due to sleep deprivation. What are some of the bigger ones? Yeah, I think firstly, what we know is that the two most feared diseases um, in the uh, in first world nations, at least cancer and Alzheimer's disease, both of them have significant relationships to a lack of sleep, especially Alzheimer's disease. Um, in fact, uh, probably over the past five or six years, we've come to learn that insufficient sleep may be one of the most significant lifestyle factors that will determine whether or not you will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. And this is not simply associational evidence. This is not just, we know at the sort of what we call epidemiological level that, you know, if you are sleeping, um, you know, six hours or less a night, um, you also have an association with Alzheimer's disease risk. That doesn't prove anything. It just means that those two things go hand in hand. But what we then discovered is that if you bring people into the laboratory and you deprive them of sleep, um, for one night, or even you just deprive them of their deep sleep, their deep non-REM sleep, the next day you can see an immediate accumulation of Alzheimer's disease, sticky toxic proteins called beta amyloid, as well as what we call tau protein, both um, in their brain, also circulating in their spinal fluid, and also in their bloodstream as well. Now, if that's the case, if um, a lack of sleep will instigate even immediately the next day uh, your Alzheimer's disease pathology sort of trajectory. Why is that? What if we go back to sort of the opposite, then when you get good sleep, what is it about good sleep that de-risks your chances of Alzheimer's disease? And several scientists some years ago made a remarkable discovery. What they found is that it's during deep sleep at night when a sewage system, a cleansing system in the brain kicks into high gear and it starts to wash away all of the metabolic byproducts that build up when you're awake. Because wakefulness is actually from a metabolic standpoint, 
wakefulness is low level brain damage. And one of the things that that cleansing system at night was washing away were these two Alzheimer's proteins, beta amyloid and also tau protein. So in other, uh, in other words, it's sort of a, an idea of um, sort of good night sleep clean, as it were. It's a power cleanse for the brain. And if you are shortchanging your brain every night, week after week, month after month, year after year, no wonder then your risk for Alzheimer's disease increases. It's like in compounding interest on a loan. It just gets worse and worse. So that's one example. Um, we also know that a lack of sleep is associated, as I said, with certain forms of cancer, um, uh, myeloma, which is a form of blood cancer, uh, breast cancer, uh, as well as lung cancer. All of these um, are associated with a doubling of your risk for their development if you're getting less than six hours of sleep. We also know that the heart is so desperately in need of sleep. Um, there is a very intimate relationship. In fact, it's during deep sleep at night that your body gets the very best form of blood pressure medication that you could ever wish for. Um, and what we've also found is that it doesn't take very much to disturb your heart. And there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year. And it's called daylight savings time. Now yeah. in the spring, when we lose just one hour of sleep, what we found is that the next day, there is actually a 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. Wow. Isn't, isn't that remarkable? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, yet in the fall, when we gain an hour of sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. And you see exactly that same type of sort of profile for other things, such as road traffic accidents on our streets, um, even suicide rates, even, by the way, the harshness of the sentencing of federal judges. People have looked at this. You don't want to get sentenced by a federal judge in spring after daylight savings time because they've lost an hour of sleep, they're in a worse mood, and they're more harsh in terms of, yeah, so it just blows, me. and it's just one hour of sleep. Mm-hmm. Mm. That that's <laughs> incredible. So let's let's talk about other diseases. Like, what about diabetes? Very strong. In fact, probably of all of the the conditions of the body, I think the relationship with a lack of sleep and diabetes is the strongest, or at least I should say, is the greatest effect size, the greatest impact. So to take a quick step back, the way that. Um, your body works when it comes to blood sugar and diabetes, type two diabetes is an issue with uh, blood sugar, is that when you eat a meal, your blood sugar rises very significantly. Now, high levels of blood sugar are actually toxic to your body and your body has figured uh, out a system to prevent this. And so when the body starts to sense that your blood sugar is rising, it releases a hormone called insulin. And then insulin tells cells in your body to sort of almost wake up and stick a straw essentially out of the cell and start sucking in the blood sugar from the bloodstream. And that lowers your blood sugar level. And so you don't get this nasty spike. But in type two diabetes, that system doesn't work and you retain this high level of toxic damaging, um, high level of blood sugar. How is this related to sleep? Well, if you take perfectly healthy individuals and you put them on a limit of, let's say, four or five hours of sleep for four or five nights, and otherwise they had no signs of diabetes, um, what you see is that they have a 40% impairment in their ability to regulate their blood sugar. In other words, if a doctor saw that, if their GP saw that level of glucose impairment, they would immediately diagnose that individual as being pre-diabetic. So five nights of insufficient sleep will turn you into being pre-diabetic. Why is this? Well, it comes back to insulin and the signaling. Firstly, when you are underslept, your body does not release enough insulin. So your cells are not receiving a strong sort of vocal command chemically from insulin to say, hey, you need to lower blood sugar. And if that wasn't bad enough, the cells of the body stop listening 
to the signal of insulin. So on both sides of the equation, you're releasing less insulin and the cells are receiving less of what little insulin is being released. And that's why we know that insufficient sleep is such a dramatic risk factor for diabetes. We also know that if we um, uh, intervene and we start to improve people's sleep, your diabetes profile starts to improve. In fact, sleeping well may be one of the most painless treatments, uh, treatment, and I'm not speaking medically here, but painless, helpful interventions when it comes to diabetes management. But doctors don't know this. Why? Because doctors receive on average less than one and a half hours of sleep education. It's not their fault. And so they don't put two and two together. But if we get people sleeping better, we can better help manage their diabetes. So related a lot to the diabetes, then what about weight loss? What about weight gain, weight loss? How does it affect that? Firstly, what we've discovered is that when you are not getting sufficient sleep, two appetite regulating hormones in your body go in bad directions. These two appetite hormones are called leptin and ghrelin. And I sometimes joke, they sound like hobbits, don't they, from Lord of the Rings? Uh, but trust me, I promise you, they're actually real hormones. Now, leptin is the hormone that tells your brain and your body, hey, you're full, you're satisfied with your food, you're no longer hungry, stop eating. Ghrelin does the opposite. It says, no, 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 you're not satisfied with your food. Even if you've eaten a full meal, it says, no, you're not satisfied. You want to eat more, you're still hungry. Now, when you are not getting sufficient sleep, the first thing that we've learned is that leptin, the thing that says, stop eating, you're full, you're satisfied, that hormone is impaired and turned down by a lack of sleep. So you lose what we call the satiety signal. If that wasn't bad enough, ghrelin, which increases your hunger, that actually goes up. And as a consequence overall, your appetite starts to skyrocket and you start to eat more. And there've been lots of wonderful experiments that have looked at this. You know, if you sort of have people on, um, limit them to let's say five, four or six hours of sleep a night for one week. And then relative to those same individuals, when they're getting a full sort of seven to nine hours of sleep and you feed them a standard meal and then you give them the ability to go to this food buffet where they can select any additional food that they like. When you are underslept, you will typically eat or overeat somewhere between an additional 200 to 400 calories at that one single sitting. Now, again, start to sort of, you know, make that logical stitching of saying that's every day across one week, across one month, across a year, you can see why we now have strong links between a lack of sleep uh, and body weight control. But it doesn't stop there either. We also know that if you're trying to manage your um, food choices, when you are underslept, the deep hedonic brain centers, the sort of reward pleasure centers, they ramp up they're sensitized in their activity, but your rational control regions of the brain that sit here in your, what we call your prefrontal cortex, they go down, they're shut off. So you become much more impulsive. You start to reach for sort of ice cream and pastries rather than leafy greens or, you know, a handful of, of nuts. So that's the, the second component of it. The final aspect that we've discovered is that let's say that you're trying to manage your weight with dieting. Well, unfortunately, if you're dieting, but you're not getting sufficient sleep, 70% of the weight that you lose will come from lean muscle mass and not fat. In other words, your body becomes stingy at giving up its fat repositories and you lose muscle. So you lose what you want to keep and you keep what you want to lose when you are underslept. And this is why sleep is not the third pillar of of health alongside diet and exercise. It's the foundation wow. on which those two other things sit. That's an incredible statement. That's fascinating. Okay, so let's just say that we run on six hours a night this week, 
really busy week, had a lot to do, so I did, didn't get my sleep. But this weekend, I can sleep in. Am I going to catch mm. up on my sleep on the weekend? Uh, it would be nice to think so. And when you are underslept, um, you do then, when you get the chance for what we call recovery sleep, you will sleep a little bit longer. But unfortunately, what we've learned is that sleep is not like the bank. You can't accumulate a debt and then hope to pay it off at some later point in time. So let's say that, you know, I take you Nelda and tonight I deprive you of sleep for an entire night. So you lose eight hours of sleep. And then in subsequent nights, I give you all of the recovery sleep that you want on a second night, third night, fourth night. Will you sleep longer on those nights? Yes, you will. But will you get back all of the eight hours that you lost? No. In fact, you usually only get back about 50% of what you lost. And so as a result, there is no capacity of your system to actually sort of, you know, there, it's, it really isn't like a credit system. And you could imagine to say, well, why isn't there a credit system for sleep? Wouldn't that be great? Because there is precedent for this. And it comes back to what we were just speaking about. It's called the adipose cell or the fat cell. Because during our evolutionary past, there were times when we had feast and there were times when we had famine. And through an evolutionary mechanism, we evolved this thing called an energy storage cell, the fat cell, so that we could store caloric energy, store, store caloric credit, and then we could spend that caloric credit when we went into debt, when we had a famine. Where is that sort of fat cell for sleep? And the answer is the following. There is no such cell because human beings are the only species that will deliberately deprive themselves of sleep for no apparent reason. And what that means is that during the course of evolution, mother nature has never had to face the challenge of this thing called a lack of sleep. You know, with very few circumstances of extreme circumstances, there is no such challenge. And so no wonder there is no safety net that we have to recover from a lack of sleep. That's why our brain and our body implodes so quickly when we even lose just that one hour of sleep, such as daylight savings time. So is it really that bad if we just get six hours? So it it really, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be, um, you know, so puritanical, but based on the weight of the evidence, it would just be untruthful for me as a scientist to say that, you know, six hours is just fine. Um, we know across the board that, you know, even just for your basic attention and your alertness and your risk for dying in a car crash, because we know that drowsy driving um, is desperately lethal. And in some ways, it can be even more lethal than drinking drunk, uh, driving drunk or under um, the intoxication of other drugs. Why is that? Because when you are drunk or you're intoxicated, typically, and it depends on how far you are on that spectrum, typically what you do is you react too late, and that's why you get into an accident. But when you are underslept, what you suffer are what we call microsleeps, where you're driving along and just for a brief moment of time, your eyelids will partially close. They won't fully close, but your brain essentially goes offline for about a second or two seconds. And at that point, if you're traveling on the freeway, there is a two ton missile going you know, 65 miles an hour and no one's in control, which means that when you come to a situation of danger, what happens is that you just don't respond at all. You don't have any reaction. So when you're intoxicated or you're inebriated, you react, but you react too late. When you are underslept and you have a microsleep, you don't react at all. And as a consequence, it may be the last microsleep that you ever have in your life. So I just have to be truthful about the science of sleep. And again, I think in this conversation, Nelda, um, and we will probably speak about things like uh, alcohol or caffeine <laughs> and these things too. But I really want to make it clear that I'm not, I'm not trying to be puritanical about this. I'm just a scientist. I'm not here to tell anyone how to live their life. All I want to do is empower you with the science of sleep and the knowledge so that you can then make informed choices as to how you want to live your life. It's not up to me to tell you how to live. But yet, you know, Matt, I, I, have had one situation in my life where I had been traveled overseas for a couple of weeks, had come home, very stressful, very little sleep, uh, and, and did 
have exactly what you just talked about happen behind the wheel of a car to myself and my husband and two of my kids were with me in the car, unaware. He was aware. They were unaware that I had had that sleep. And But it was absolutely the most terrifying event that I can tell you of my life, probably, was to think that I almost took all four of our lives in just a momentary lapse of sleep. That and it's so understandable again, because we think, you know, even if you have start to have a sense, yes, I'm a bit sleepy, you think, well, you know, I'll just turn up the radio or I'll wind down the, sort of the window or I'll sort of slap my face or I'll splash some, you know, water on my face. And in with people who have had these accidents and I've had countless just tragic emails since I wrote the book, people telling me about this, that they've lost a family because of uh, a drowsy driving related accident. You just have to think, is it worth it? Mm. You know? What if I were to just, you know, pull off the road um, and, you know, just switch drivers? Or if I'm underslept, is it really worth me taking this drive? Um, I, I would just make that thought. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So let's talk about then you mentioned a minute ago, people who have the nightcap before bed, you know, is alcohol helping us sleep? Oh, um, I have to preface this by saying I'm a deeply unpopular person just by personality um, alone. And I'm also British, which is two strikes against me. Um, but when I tell you this evidence, it's going to make things only worse. I'm desperately unpopular now. Unfortunately, alcohol is not your friend when it comes to sleep. Alcohol is probably the most misunderstood sleep aid that there is out there. It's no such thing. Um, and people will often understandably turn to alcohol when over-the-counter remedies have failed and they're struggling with sleep. The first issue with alcohol is that it's in a class of drugs that we call the sedatives. And sedation is not sleep. So when you have a nightcap and you think, well, I fell asleep much more quickly and it helps me fall asleep, that's wrong. You're simply sedating your brain. You're not going into natural sleep. The second issue with alcohol is that it fragments your sleep. So you wake up many more times throughout the night. Your night is littered with these awakenings. It's what we call sleep fragmentation. But the problem is you don't remember those awakenings. So you wake up the next morning and you feel unrefreshed and unrestored by your sleep, but you don't remember waking up so you don't think it's the alcohol. The final issue with alcohol is that it's very good at blocking your dream sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep, which as we've said before, is essential for a variety of different functions, including your mental health. And so in those three ways, alcohol really is best to sort of, you know, be avoided. Um, again, you know, life is to be lived to a degree. And, you know, having a glass of wine with dinner, you know, once or twice a week, I can't tell you that that glass of wine is not going to impact your sleep. It will. But just try to think about the balance between those two things. You know, I think the other thing that I would say, which is, utterly politically incorrect, and I would never say it on a public broadcast, would be the following, which is that um, just go to the pub in the morning, and that way the alcohol is out your system by the evening, and that way there's no problem at all. But I would never say that as, some, as, a, as a scientist uh, and in the clinical world. Uh, anyway, um, so that's, that's alcohol for you. That's alcohol. What about eating late then? Eating late is, is interesting. Um, there is some evidence that if you have um, a meal too late, usually too late means sort of within about 90 minutes of going to sleep or even sort of two hours, it can be deleterious because usually your sort of digestive system wants to also undergo the reboot of sleep. But if, if it's sort of still you know, in this high phase of digestion, it's actually still going to be in its phase of digestion, you know, from the meal that you eat at, let's say 6 p.m. throughout the night. But there's something in that high level range that's not optimal. The other component, um, or there's two components uh, that I should additionally mention. The first is that if you eat late and then you lie consistently for several hours, which is of course what we do with sleep, a lot of people can actually have reflux mm -hmm. and that reflux ends up making them wake up and that will again fragment their sleep. The other thing is just to be mindful of what you eat. You know, if you're someone who, I think the general advice is don't go to bed too full, 
don't go to bed too hungry. It's sort of like the Goldilocks mm. sort of idea. You know, it's that sweet spot somewhere in the middle. If you feel as though you need a little bit of a snack before bed, try to make it a higher protein snack. Uh, for example, if you can have some sort of Greek yogurt, um, you know, or even um, sort of protein with a little bit of healthy fat, you know, a little a sort of handful of a few nuts, etc. What you don't want, however, is a high sugar meal. Um, so high sugar, such as, you know, cereal, breakfast cereals, packed usually full of sugar. And the reason is because that sugar will increase your metabolic rate. And when your metabolic rate increases, your body warms up. And this is another critical feature of good sleep, that we need to cool down to fall asleep and stay asleep. And it's the reason you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too uh, cold than too hot. Because, sorry, the, you will always find it easier, yes, to fall asleep in the room that's too cold because too cold is taking you in the right temperature direction for good sleep. But yet when you eat that sugary sort of meal in the evening late, metabolic in, uh, rate increases, the sugar burns, you warm up, and that can also compromise your sleep too. So in general, what we found with food, not just meal timing, but food in general, is that a diet that is high in sugar and low in fat is the very worst for sleep. Well, you know, we live in a culture that does say that sleep is a waste of time. I remember even as as much as a year ago, just saying to my husband, when I, I'm sorry, I just don't have time to sleep. It's going to be such a bother, right? Because I need, yeah. I need to keep going. Um, and I, uh, one of my team members had a quote when they were talking the other day. It says, I can sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. And it why, is. Where did we get that in our culture? It is interesting, isn't it? I think sleep has an image problem that we stigmatize people who get mm. sufficient sleep as either lazy or slothful. And in part, it's because of that fallacy, that misassumption that when we're asleep, body is just at rest. It's not really doing anything and our brain's just dormant. So, you know, it's just a waste of time. But now what we've learned, you know, we used to ask the question 20 years ago, you know, why do we sleep? And the best answer we had was we sleep to cure sleepiness, which is the, the stupid equivalent of saying, you know, we eat to cure hunger. It tells you nothing about the benefit of food. Now we've had to upend that question. Based on the weight of the evidence, we've actually had to sort of ask the question, is there anything in your body or any major operation of your brain that isn't wonderfully enhanced by sleep when we get it or demonstrably impaired when we don't get enough? And the answer seems to be no. But that science of sleep, I don't think yet, has made its way out into the public. You know, I think sleep is the neglected stepsister in the health conversation of today. So no wonder we don't value it. No wonder we devalue sleep. And worse still, we start to give it these terrible negative labels. And so we wear our badge of honor of a lack of sleep, you know, on our arm as if it's something to be proud of. And therefore, we have this mentality of saying, well, sleep is a waste. It's a waste of time. You... I would argue so strongly from a scientific perspective that you should think in the opposite direction. When you're there at night and you're thinking, I just need to get one more hour of work done, or I'm just going to sort of, you know, go to bed, you know, let's say one or two, I just need to push on through. Don't see it like that. Instead, think about getting to sleep tonight as an investment in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's not a cost for you for tomorrow. It's in fact, it's sort of, it's going to be a desperate cost if you don't get to sleep because you're going to be inefficient. And we know this from all of the data. You're not going to be making the right work-based choices. You're not going to be creative. And, you know, I often think of, uh, of the studies that we've done in the workplace, looking at how inefficient you are when you're not sort of well slept. And I think of a workforce that's not getting a efficient sleep. It's a little bit like stationary spin bikes at the gym. Everyone looks like they're working hard, but there's no forward movement. The scenery never changes. And that's the, the situation when it comes to sleep. So, you know, invest in sleep and then think about the following analogy. Why would you, if you're trying to boil a pot of water on an oven, you know, on a burner, why would you boil it at medium heat 
when you could do it in half the time on high. That's what getting a good night of sleep is. That's why it's an investment in tomorrow, not a cost to you. So Matt, recently uh, we got to speak to Nicholas Carr about how our computer screens are constantly messing up our minds. Um, And I'm just curious, how are the screens affecting our sleep? Yeah, I certainly think that the invasion of technology into the bedroom has been a deleterious influence. Um, And it's for a number of different reasons, but one of them comes to exactly what you're saying, which is this sort of blue light uh, sort of signal that comes through these devices will actually block a hormone called melatonin. And melatonin helps with the timing of your sleep. But yet if we uh, sort of get assaulted by all of this electrical light at night, and especially the blue light from our devices, it stamps the brakes on melatonin. So we don't release melatonin at night. So no wonder many people are struggling with sort of trying to fall asleep. So the trick there would be in the last hour before bed, try to do away with using your devices and the screens, but also in the last hour, dim down half or even um, 70% of all of the lights in your home. And you will be surprised at how sleepy that makes you feel. Because in this modern world, we are a dark deprived society and we need darkness at night to release that healthy hormone of melatonin. That is so fascinating. If you only knew, you need to look right at the camera and say to my husband, Nelda is right about dimming the lights. Anyway. What's his name? (laughs) Carl. Carl, Nelda is 100% right about dimming the lights. I'm sorry, Carl. (laughs) That's so good. Ah, That'll be a nice argument later. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) So let's talk about how we can sleep better then. Let's turn to that because... Dimming the lights, that's part of it. So let's just go from there. What else do we need to do to help ourselves sleep better at night? Yeah, I think there are probably at least five tips of what we call sort of sleep hygiene that can help. And we've touched on some of them. Um, The first is regularity. Go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time, no matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend. Um, Regularity is king and it will anchor your sleep and improve as a consequence the quantity and the quality of that sleep. The second we've just mentioned, which is darkness, try to envelop yourself in that darkness. Otherwise your brain just consistently thinks, well, it's still daytime and I should be awake. The third component we've already um, mentioned too, which is temperature. Actually what you need is a bedroom temperature of around about 65 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. It sounds cold, I know, but cold it must be. Now, if you want to, you can bring a hot water bottle to bed and sort of put that on your feet or you can wear socks, but the ambient needs to be cold. Cold will help you fall asleep and help you stay asleep. The third, um, uh, sorry, the fourth uh, component of this is walk it out. And what I mean by that is don't stay in bed lying awake for very long periods of time. And the rule of thumb here is 25 minutes. If you've been trying to fall asleep, it's been 25 minutes. Or you're trying to fall back asleep and it's been 25 minutes. Don't worry. Just realize that, you know, tonight is one of those nights. That's fine. Everyone can have a bad night. Get up and in a different room under dim light, just read a book or do some light stretches or meditate, which is also great for sleep. And then only return to bed when you are sleepy. And there's no time limit for that. And the reason is this. If you lie in bed awake, your brain starts to learn the association that your bed is this place of being awake. It becomes a trigger of wakefulness. And this is why people will say to me, look, you know, Matt, I'm I'm falling asleep watching television and then I get into bed and I'm wide awake and I don't know why. And the reason is because you've learned this bad association and we need to break that association. And gradually by only returning to bed when you're sleepy, will you bond a healthy relationship there? And so the analogy would be, you would never sit at a dinner table waiting to get hungry. So why would you lie in bed waiting to get sleepy? And the answer is you shouldn't. Um, The final thing I will mention is caffeine. We've spoken about alcohol. 
caffeine um, has problematic relationships with sleep um, in three ways. Firstly, we all know that caffeine wakes us up. It's what we call a psychoactive stimulant. Um, the, the second issue with caffeine, however, is that it usually will make it harder for you to fall asleep, but also stay asleep. So you will wake up more times throughout the night. The, the third issue with caffeine is that even if you're someone who says, look, I can have an espresso with dinner and I fall asleep fine and, and I stay asleep, I'm, I'm good. Usually what happens there is that you still don't get your deep sleep. Caffeine will actually block some of that deep sleep. So again, you wake up the next morning, you don't feel restored or refreshed by your sleep, but you don't remember waking up because you didn't, but you don't have your deep sleep. So now you find yourself reaching for two or three cups of coffee in the morning rather than one, hence an addiction dependency cycle. The final issue with caffeine to keep in mind is its timing. Caffeine has what we call a half-life of about five to six hours in the average person. In other words, after about five to six hours, 50% of that caffeine is still in your system, which means that caffeine has a quarter life of 10 to 12 hours. In other words, if you have a coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still in your brain at midnight. So having a cup of coffee at noon would be the equivalent of sort of before you turn the light out at, at midnight, you swig a quarter of a cup of Starbucks and you hope for a good night of sleep and it's probably not going to happen. Um, so again, just keep this in mind. Now, I don't want to suggest that caffeine isn't useful. Having a cup of coffee or a couple of cups of coffee in the morning is just fine. In fact, there are some really great health benefits of caffeine, but the timing and the dose makes the poison. Once you get past three or four cups, the health benefits decrease and go the opposite way. And if you're taking that caffeine in afternoon, let's say that's when sleep uh, impacts become a problem. So those would be the five tips, I think. Regularity, darkness, temperature, don't lie in bed awake. And then finally, keep an eye out on your caffeine and your alcohol. The last thing I would say, Nelda, is the following. These are tips for people who are not suffering from a sleep disorder, such as insomnia or such as sleep apnea, which is heavy snoring. Um, if you w are concerned about either one of those, please go and see your doctor because there are available treatments. They are clinical disorders that come at remarkable health cost. So the analogy with these tips that I've just shared would be the following. You know, if I'm your sports coach, I can give you all of these tips for improving your performance. But if you have a broken ankle, none of them are going to make any difference until we fix the broken ankle. And that's going to be the situation when it comes to insomnia or sleep apnea. Well, it's a good thing that you spoke about all those other things after caffeine, because I was going to tell you, you had now gone into meddling. Because that's the way you say it in the South. You now, now you're meddling. I just okay? adore your accent, by the way. But yeah, and I don't want to be. Uh, I'm going to budge this, but meddling uh, in anyone's uh, business. So, uh, morning coffee, go at it. By the way, the benefits of a cup of coffee are also. It's not about the caffeine. We've discovered, and Michael Pollan wrote a great book about this. He's a good friend and a writer here at, in Berkeley, and. What you realize is that if you look at the health benefits of caffeine, and there are lots, very similar to sleep actually, which is paradoxical. Um, if you then look at the same data, but with decaffeinated coffee, you get almost the same types of relationships. Yeah. And what he's argued is that because in first world nations, our diet uh, is so poor for the most part, sort of what's been called the standard American diet, the coffee bean is very rich in antioxidants. And a cup of coffee in the morning is the only way that most of us, most sort of Americans, in fact, British people with tea, most of us actually get that good dose of antioxidants. So it's the antioxidants that are taking a piggyback ride on this vehicle called a cup of joe, a cup of coffee in the morning, that provides those health benefits, not the caffeine itself. Well, that is good to know. Then I'll let you. I'll let you slide on it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to be meddling. I, I that is not in my nature. <laughs> well, we are almost out of time, and I I really would like to say, what can parents do for children? I guess to help them get enough sleep. You know, mine are going. My youngest two are going into middle school, so we're entering teen years. 
Yeah, I, so I think for younger children, there's some really nice evidence. So for children across the board, and in fact, adults as well, it comes back to regularity. You know, when you unbuckle children from their standard schedule, um, they will start to have real issues with sleep. So keep it consistent there. The second component for younger children is try to make their bedroom simply the place where they're sleeping. So one study found that if you remove all of the toys out of the bedroom, you start to help the child realize that this thing called the bedroom, just as we were speaking with adults, is the place where all I do is sleep. And you build that association. They're sponges. They will learn that association. But if they go into a room that's filled with toys, you know, their brain is thinking, okay, this is the place where I'm activated, I'm happy, and I'm, I'm really bouncing off the walls because it's fun playing with toys. And then I also have this thing called the bed. So it doesn't mean that you have to take the toys out of the bedroom, but if you can try to pack them away so there's not that visual stimulus. Um, the other thing is having some kind of a wind down routine for children. So, and this is the same for teenagers and it's the same for adults too, but it's a different set of wind downs. So if it's giving them a bath, that also works for adults, by the way, and teenagers. Um, if it's reading to them, find out whatever it is that helps them fall asleep and then stick to it like a regiment. That can be really critical too. Well, is there anything else you want to leave with our audience, Matthew? I think simply recognizing that sleep is the single most effective thing that you can do to reset your brain and body health every day. And you mentioned your colleague who said, you know, I can sleep when I'm dead. Well, based on the evidence, honestly, it is mortally unwise advice because we know from epidemiological studies across millions of individuals, a very simple truth that using that sweet spot of seven to nine hours a night as the reference, um, the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. Short sleep predicts wow. all cause mortality. So if you want to elongate your lifespan, but more importantly, I would argue, if you want to elongate your health span, sleep is perhaps the very best investment you can make. Sleep is the elixir of life. It is the Swiss army knife of health. Mm. Well, thank you so much for being here. Now, where can You're people so follow you and find you? Oh, you probably shouldn't follow me. You've, you've had enough of my uh, nonsensical rhetoric. Um, but if you're desperate, uh, I'm on uh, Twitter at Sleep Diplomat. I have a website, uh, Sleep Diplomat as well. Um, I'm not on Instagram, although someone has my handle, which is Sleep Diplomat, and I think they masquerade as me. Um, but the content is fine. But uh, I'm not on Instagram, but I am on Twitter, um, and uh, I also am on the web. And you can just find me for the most part if you just, um, yeah, look around. Well, Matthew, thank you. It's been just delightful. Thank you for now. Being thank you so much for having me. And thank you. I'm going to anoint you now as a sleep ambassador. Oh, um, okay. Because, you know, I, I am on, you know, a, a mission. I, I, I am desperately mm. trying to reunite humanity with the sleep that it is so bereft of. And I can't do it alone. I need to have to partner with wonderful people like yourself where we can have these conversations and we can help empower the public with this type of knowledge. So thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate your time and, and thank you again. Thank you. I'm honored. Look, we have lots of great interviews on Melder Lives, so hit like and subscribe. There's much more to come. Thank you.